This is Louis Kaiser. I'm going to be presenting excerpts from some of the lectures of Torquem Saradarian that have been made available on YouTube, and I'm going to be providing you with an introduction to them. This is the first of them on his lecture about the heart. Torquem Saradarian was one of the greatest spiritual teachers of the 21st century. He was certainly my elder brother and spiritual teacher. He leaves a legacy of over 170 books and uh, works of spiritual music and many other things that are overseen by his daughter Gita Saradarian with the TSG Foundation. I strongly recommend that you uh, learn about Torquem Saradarian if you have not already done so and that you look up the TSG Foundation website. One of the things that he and I very strongly agreed upon was the future of woman in spiritual leadership. My greatest teacher, of course, was Mother Jenny, a woman. My wife is developing as a great spiritual teacher, and Gita Saradarian is one of those as well that Torquem referred to in his book, Woman, Torch of the Future. So I strongly recommend that you uh, look at some of the writings that you can find at TSG Foundation. Here we're going to present uh, one of his lectures that has to do with the heart. I'd like to introduce you to the heart in mystic language, especially that of Yeshua. This particular slide is taken from uh, my Yeshua Seminar, which was given on Easter of the year 2008 and which is available at wisdomseminars.org. In Hebrew and Aramaic, the word for heart was leb or lebav, and it referred to the physical heart, but it was also considered to be the seat of the mind and the feelings and the sensibilities, and it was often translated into words like mind or soul, suke in the New Testament, and so on. There's a Semitic idiom, the thoughts of the heart. Well, this word is identical with the Egyptian word for heart, which was lev, the same word. Many of the ideas, especially the esoteric and Kabbalistic ideas that were transmitted through mystical Judaism and uh, that were current at the time of Yeshua, uh, derive from Egyptian prototypes and uh, Egyptian knowledge that goes far back into the ancient past. Among the Egyptians, the heart as an organ was the only organ that was not removed from the body in mummification because it was considered to be the physical seat of the souls, the ba and the ka. Now the Egyptian hieroglyph for the heart was a pictograph of a storage container or jar. And that was the first image we have. Now this is a very important thing to understand. The heart is like a storage jar or a storage container. The Aramaic root for this word, levav, was atsad, treasure, like the Egyptian leb, jar. And uh, it was a place where Precious fluids and wine and nectars and aromatic oils would be stored, not solids, not money, but very precious fluids. Yeshua said, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. The heavenly atzad, or treasure, that was stored in the heart was immortal. And after death, it advocates for the soul. Yeshua told the story of the unjust steward, a man who uh, was not doing his job working for a master, and he wasn't collecting the money he needed to collect from all the people renting land and the tenants and so on. And he heard that the master was going to call him in and fire him for that, so he went first around to all the tenants and cut their bills in half and collected it from them. And uh, then when he was fired... Uh, they all received him into their homes, and he was their friend, and they were very, uh, very supportive of him. And he said that this is like your good deeds, the good works you do in life are like this, because after they die, they accompany you. They accompany you 
and they are like the treasure of your heart. And the greatest treasure of the heart, which is represented by the good Yetzer in Kabbalistic uh, doctrine, or the uh, divine spark, the image of God, the imago dei, that's within the heart in Kabbalistic uh, teaching, is that thing which every human being has that brings him uh, into connection with deity. And it is that image of God that uh, exists in the heart. It's known also as a divine spark or a flame in the chalice. In our services, we always put a candle in our chalice when we do communion services before we begin with the sacrament because we symbolize the spark of the divine image in the heart. Now this can be compared with the Sanskrit Jiva or Jiva Atma or Atma. Jiva is the immortal essence of a living being and it couldn't be a human being or an animal or a fish or a plant. It's that essence which survives physical death as distinct from the unchanging Atma the monadic being, the physical jivatma carries forward and stores the positive and negative energies and knowledge that have been developed and accumulated in each successive incarnation. So as you go from incarnation to incarnation, you don't take with you your knowledge of a spoken language, although you may take with you the talent to learn that language in another lifetime, but you bring with you the really important nectars that you have developed compassion, concern for justice, all the things that are the divine way. This, uh, this heart, this jiva, which is at the heart chakra, uh, is represented in this little diagram. We have this little drawing uh, with a six-pointed star, triang triangle up and a triangle down, and three deities. Uh, the deity Shiva, which is Godhead, the Ishtadevata, which is the form of Godhead that you individually worship. There are, of course, thousands of those and thousands of names of Shiva in Hindu religion and thousands of ways in Buddhism. And uh, in Christianity, the Ishtadevata would be Yeshua. And the third image is that of Kundalini, the Kundalini Shakta. And those sit upon the heart chakra, and they contain the nectars that you uh, accumulate during your lifetime and you bring with you from lifetime to lifetime in the evolution of your soul. Now, as I say, this is not discursive knowledge. It's not personal knowledge, uh, but it includes the innate talent for them. So the immortal heavenly treasures that transmigrate from incarnation to incarnation are spiritual qualities or nectars like compassion and fidelity and discernment. And that is the meaning of the heart as a jar that contains nectars. And these treasures are gifts of the Yetzer Hatov, the good, the good Yetzer, the good impulse that can be cultivated in the heart only through the tests and trials and purifications that happen during physical incarnation. During the Wisak meditation, uh, Wisak water is left out and uh, at the exact time of Wisak, blessings are put into the water, and then the water is distributed to each of the disciples who drink it. And this is emblematic or symbolic of the idea of receiving these nectars and these uh, essences in the heart. Now let's go on to uh, look at something interesting that we science tells us about the heart. The Institute of Heart Math which you will find at www.heartmath.com, uh, has created a biofeedback system that you can load onto your computer that will allow you to access the heart brain. We have really three brains in our constitution. We have our mental brain, which is upstairs in our skull. We also have the solar plexus, which is our animal brain, which uh, senses many kinds of things that the brain upstairs doesn't and uh, includes fear and things like this. And then we have the heart, which actually sends out more impulses and receives more impulses than our f 
physical brain upstairs does. And so we can refer to the heart as a heart brain. It, it balances and cultivates uh, coherency between the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems in every beat. And if you have high coherency in your heart, then you are operating at a very efficient level mentally and emotionally and uh, in meditation. And you can see that if you perform, for example, certain pranayama, you can radically uh, improve your the coherency of your heart. So this biofeedback system, the heart math system, allows you to look at your heart rhythm and as the heart rhythm becomes sinusoidal and becomes like a sine wave, uh, that represents the coherency between your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems and the means that the, it optimizes you for meditation, for thinking, for action, for creative work, and so forth. Now, that's something we can look at on a screen. If we are not uh, in high co coherency, we're living in, in unbalanced emotions like frustration, this is the kind of uh, graph we get with the red line. It shows that our, our heart, which is always going faster, slower, faster, slower, a good heart does that, uh, to, it responds to the environment, but it'll do so in a very erratic way. However, when you're feeling gratitude or appreciation or doing pranayama and readying yourself for meditation, you will get uh, a pattern like this one uh, with the blue line, which is uh, showing what the emotion of gratitude or appreciation produces in you, in your heart. And this is a nice sinusoidal uh, rhythmic pattern of the heart being faster, slower, faster, slower in a rhythmic way, and this gives you coherence. And uh, the heart math system allows you to use a lot of little games and things to develop coherence. This is one I especially like. As you develop coherence in your heart, it shows the, a little child uh, putting out blessing from his heart to the planet. And uh, as uh, you develop coherence, lower coherence, medium coherence, and finally higher coherence, it shows this uh, kind of biofeedback. Now let's listen to uh, part of a lecture by Torquem Sardarian about the importance of the heart. And let's remember that the great Protestant mystics, Böhme, Gichtel, and uh, in the Rosicrucian traditions in Europe that were those that, uh, that pre preceded Torquem Sardarian and his father who were Armenians and Rosicrucians, uh, that the heart was the most important thing to understand and it was the basis for spiritual life and growth. Here is a, a lecture by Torco. Our place is small, but our heart is big. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Today I'm talking about heart. How we can unfold our heart and what is the purpose and significance of the heart. Some universities sent me their brochures and their uh, schedules. And it was interesting for me very much because I like education. And I tried to read all of them, what they are teaching. There are every kind of teaching in the world that they are teaching except about heart. It really surprised me. The schools and textbooks and universities and colleges, they are teaching everything. But they forgot the most essential. There is not a school, there is not a teacher, there is not a curriculum that teaches the heart. Isn't that amazing? Is the heart important? Yes, the heart is very important. Because heart controls your motives, your intentions, your cooperation, your attitudes in the life, your safety of your family, success of your family depends on the heart. You know this, huh? If there is no love, there is no tenderness, there is no sympathy, there is no cooperation in the house, in the home, that family disintegrates. 
So the other day, three, four engineers came here. They are mechanical engineers and they are the philosophers, this or that. They came to ask why we are fighting the ant night in our family. I said, what about if you go ask to your university diploma? I said, your diploma will tell you. He says, are you joking? No, I said. You learned everything under the sun, except you learned about the heart. If you are so smart, so big in your mind and your informations, do something at your home and find a little harmony and beauty at your home. He understood what I was saying, of course, because he was very smart, but there was no heart, you see. And uh, I talked about heart to him. And he said that this is what is lacking at our home. Your associates, where you are working, your groups, your nations, the strongest nations in the world in the future after 2000 will be those nations that develop their heart, not their mind. 